Hello, everyone. We are back for another episode of Career Talk with OG. And uh, today we have an OG. He's the real OG, okay? He's a real OG. Alberto Esparza, un amigo mío who has 40 years of social justice activism working with Latino communities and building bridges and empowering the Latino community. In fact, uh, you know, and Alberto will share a little bit more, but Alberto uh, worked with Cesar Chavez, all right, and many other uh, leaders in our country, you know, that have made a huge difference. And Alberto, I, I am really, really honored, and it is special, I feel very special that you are with us because I think I shared with you my major at UC Berkeley was Chicano studies. And so I feel like I have the pleasure to do a live interview of a very influential figure yourself that has experienced and been there and done that in the Chicano movement and just in so many areas. So Alberto, bienvenido a Career Talk with OG. Well, thank you, OG. It's a great honor to be on your podcast. I look forward to the dialogue and it is my hope that I can see, inspire some folks out there as well. So thank you again. Oh, you will, you will. And, uh, you know, so I uh, I, I just want to read just a, a few things, uh, Alberto, about you that you've done. And, um, you know, before we get started here, but uh, I mean, one, you're you're the founder of CISA Puede Foundation. Uh, you're also uh, the founder of iRise Foundation. And, uh, you know, you've uh, been serving Many of the schools, children, communities out in the uh, Nogales, uh, uh, Sonora area in Mexico, down in Arizona, Chandler, and so forth. And you've served on many boards and commissions. And um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I just look here at your bio and it's, it, it, you've just done so many things and you continue to do many things for our community. But why don't you, uh, why don't we start first, Alberto, with you sharing um, with our, our viewers, our listeners, um, a little more about who Alberto is and your journey and maybe take us back to how this all started. Okay. Well, I was born and raised in the Phoenix, Arizona, and I was raised by my grandmother who adopted me. And I believe when I was three years old, so I just uh, saw her as being my mom. Even though I had a biological mother, I always viewed my grandmother. My grandmother was very instrumental in my growing up. Uh, she was my, my role model, my everything. She was a leader servant uh, at that time, and she didn't realize she was a leader servant. But I recall her in the early days in the kitchen. As we all know, the grandmas are always in the kitchen making pots of menudo, making pots of red chili, <laughs> green chili burritos and i would always see her making burritos and she was serving food to the homeless mm -hmm. and she would take me along her journey and this was a daily ritual and we would serve burritos and we would serve um, sodas like pepsi coca-cola and all that kind of stuff like that and she did it daily and even though that she was sick she continued to to make those meals and have other people come and distribute, but she would always drag <laughs> me along her. <laughs> I would always cry because I was um, not used to this and I would see some strange people out there, but eventually she would say, you'll get used to it. And one day you're gonna be serving the homeless. And um, so I would go out there on a daily basis with her. So she was my role, role model. And that's where I think I gained um, knowledge of a certain, you know, of a servant, uh, leader and um, don't want to get emotional, but every time I talk about her, she, uh, I get very emotional. She lived until she was about 85 years old. And, um, you know, she would tell me that one day you're going to make a difference and one day you're going to become a leader. And um, I didn't realize that that was going to come true. Um, when she passed, I must've been like 21 years old. It was very difficult. Um, I went on to Phoenix College. I wasn't the greatest student in the world. I did, um, didn't do well in high school. I think I graduated mm, really at the bottom. But uh, my grandmother wanted me to go to college, so I just said, you know what, I'm going to go to college and uh, do this for her. So 
I went to the Phoenix College, and it was there that I found activismo. I joined a club called Mecha. Oh, and yes. Mecha, I remember Mecha. Socially <laughs> conscious. And I remember this young lady. <laughs> well, I'd like to pause for a second. There are some uh, of our viewers and listeners that, uh, even Latinos, that don't know what Mecha stands for. Please tell us just really briefly about Mecha, what it stands for, and, and, and Mecha. Mecha was a social organization that really um, gave back to the community. They were heavily involved in boycotts. They were heavily involved in making a difference, planting seeds of purpose and ambition in young Latinos' lives. They would be in the elementary schools promoting education. Uh, they were very socially active. Uh, they were under the auspices of the United Farm Workers Union and Cesar Chavez. And uh, they would always encourage me. They would see me daily at the, at the lunchroom. And I remember I came across a beautiful Latina who spoke brilliantly. And she would always ask me, why aren't you involved? When were you going to be involved? And it always encouraged me to go to a meeting. So I went to the first meeting and um, I saw a lot of OGs. They just they came back from Vietnam. So there was a lot <laughs> of veterans there, brown barrettes. And uh, this young lady spoke very eloquently and encourage us to get involved. And um, that's how I got involved. And then uh, weeks later, we got involved in some boycotts and then um, marches on social justice. And I remember at the Phoenix College, there wasn't enough Latino professors. So we boycotted the dean, the dean of the school and uh, we did a sit-in and uh, we got arrested. So that was my first encounter of uh, you know, being arrested by the police. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that I would like to say is that the marches and the boycotts are not like what you see today. Back in the day, we were all trained in nonviolence under the auspices of Mahama Gandhi and Cesar Chavez and Dr. King. So that's the philosophy that we came in. There was a lot of training on that and um, very respectful. And we always had the image of the Virgen de Guadalupe in front yeah. And uh, it was very polite, uh, very respectful. Not what you see today where there's a lot of violence. So we as OGs get discouraged by seeing that because it wasn't, it wasn't the time when we were getting, um, we were going out there and boycott. Sure, there was violence, but it was never from our end. It sure. was just those who didn't agree with our cause. So that's where I truly, truly got involved. And it was the best three years of my life there. I learned a lot from these young people, these young Latinas. And, I, and, and the young Latinas at that time were outstanding leaders. And I truly believe that, that women make the best leaders. Because mm. throughout my career, whether it be in social activism or whether it be in nonprofits, they've, they, have, they have had a tremendous impact on our cause and our schools and our communities. So when I'm no longer here with iRise Foundation, I'm going to be um, looking for a Latina to take my place because, uh, <laughs> because I, I do believe that you need a mm, motherly kind of person there to deal with the children and the families and that sort of thing. So that's how I truly got involved in activism. It was through the Phoenix College, it was through Mecha and Mecha was socially conscious, and they had a lot of kids at that time who were um, who were enamored with Cesar Chavez and were enamored with his philosophy of nonviolence and making a change in our communities and boycotting. So I got the first taste, and I loved it. Even though um, we boycotted Phoenix College at that time, and um, we all got arrested, but it was probably the best experience of my life because I said I finally got my stripes, OG, right there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. Oh gosh, I, I bet they, and um, you touched on many things here. And so again, everyone, Mecha stands for Mo Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan. And uh, as Alberto mentioned, it's a social movement uh, organization, very influential, and many other organizations, um, both. Mecha was standing on the shoulders of other organizations, and just like today, other or uh, newer organizations today are standing on the shoulders of Mecha and, and many others. Um, and I bet that too, you know, I'm glad that, that you acknowledge, uh, you make the comment and acknowledge about the uh, the power of women in, in leadership roles. Because I was going to tell you, I'm I'm starting to see here a pattern here with your grandmother influencing you, 
this um, uh, woman that you mentioned who spoke very eloquently uh, at Mecha. And so, yes, uh, the power and the influence of, uh, of women uh, in, in leadership roles. Throughout my career, I've seen some outstanding Latina women who just make the best leaders. And I acknowledge that. I mean, uh, they have a lot of leadership qualities that, that um, if we had a president, and if it's a woman, I think this world would be, the United States would be a lot better off, quite honestly. Yeah. And I'm hoping that one day there is a Latina woman as president of the United States. I think that's going to be pretty awesome to see. But um, that's, that's where everything started. And when I went to um, Arizona State University, a lot of those students who were at Phoenix College eventually went to Arizona State University. Mm. So I got hooked up again, again with the, the social activism. And that's where I met my mentor, Ben Miranda. Ben Miranda was an attorney who worked for the United Farm Workers Union and was very instrumental in shaping who I am today in terms of activism. He's the one that introduced me to the United Farm Workers Union introduced me to Cesar Chavez and uh, invited me to become a bodyguard for Cesar Chavez. Oh, ben yeah, Miranda, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he passed away a few years back. And it's unfortunate because if there was any person to replace the Cesar Chavez, it was Ben Miranda. He did, he was very, he's very inspirational to me, very inspirational to the city of Phoenix in Arizona. He had a lot of nonprofits that gave a lot of scholarships, did a lot of work pro bono for those families that didn't have the funding. So he is really the one that got me involved in social activism and got me involved with the United Farm Workers Union. Mm, gotcha. Well, tell, us, um, tell us more about your experience uh, working with Cesa Chavez as, as his bodyguard had. It was very interesting. The first time I met him, I was in awe. I was speechless because I had seen him in documentaries. I seen him in the news. And um, when Ben Miranda asked me to go meet him, I was in awe. I speechless, basically. I had seen yeah. a man who was very impactful in our community, who wore his heart on his sleeve, and a social agent, a true social agent, so humble, dressed so humbly. But when he spoke, you heard that and uh, when he asked me to be a bodyguard i said yes and um it was the best thing that's ever happened to me um we were so protective of him very protective of him that a lot of people couldn't shake his hands <laughs> <laughs> but we were just he was a treasure so we were we were protecting him as best we could, but he would always get angry with us because we were too protective. But <laughs> yeah, but it was very exciting. And that's the reason why I started the nonprofit called Cesar Puerto Foundation, because that slogan belongs to Dolores Huerta. She was the first yes. to bring that during the movement. And that was a phrase of uh, inspiration to motivate people to get in yes. the car and to support to support those issues that really need to support. And um, so that's where it came from. But being with Cesar Chavez really changed my life. I got some photos and I think I posted them on LinkedIn, but the one that we're in church and I'm on his left side. So if folks can go on LinkedIn and kind of scroll down, we're in a church and I'm on his left side and we're all praying and that's an iconic photo. And back then we didn't take a lot of photos, OG. It was like, <laughs> you know, who's taking photos? But yeah. I had went to Walgreens and I brought one of those cameras you could throw away and uh, <laughs> we took some photos and thank God I have that photo because um, that photo is precious to me. That means everything that defines that defines everything that I believe in. And who there I it am. is. There it is. Look, everyone. <laughs> Look at that good looking guy on his left. Wow. Look, at that. Hey. Look at that head of hair, OG. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm right there, and the other um, gentlemen right there were strong followers of United Farm Workers. We believed in this movement. We believed in nonviolence. We believed in everything that he was preaching, and we would give in our lives for him because that's yeah. who we believed in. It was wow. a different time, really. of course. very different time. And yeah. to be seated with him, to talk to him, to eat with him. But again, I go back to my mentor, Ben Miranda. He was very instrumental in shaping who I am today. And uh, if there's anybody that could have replaced Cesar Chavez, I think it would have been him. 
He was the attorney for the United Farm Workers Union. Just a beautiful man. And uh, so I owe him a lot of credit from time to time. From time to time, I'll go on Facebook and I'll post his photo. Yeah. Up there just as a reminder of how much he's missed. But uh, oh, gosh, what, my, uh, journey, my journey was unique. You know, very yeah. unique. Well, and, and again, uh, you know, as I as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Alberto, me, me being a Chicano studies major, and um, I mean, I'm, I mean, the truth is, is that, but as as Latinos, even as Mexicanos or Mexican Americans, we all have we have different stories. We're not just one group, right? And, and in my case, I mean, my parents were from Mexico. Uh, my mother came here undocumented. We, they, my parents worked in the fields uh, for several months, and they basically were the scabs. They broke the picket line because, as coming from Mexico, with the need, you know, as we say in Spanish, la necesidad es muy grande, right? They, they, they needed the money. They weren't aware of all the social injustice or all the, the movements, right? Like many immigrants that come here to this country for the first time, you're not aware to what's going on, and and so. I grew up more Mexicano cultures. My parents listening to um, um, Pedro Infante music, Lola Beltran, you know, kind of that that era back then, right? They didn't listen to Malo. They didn't listen to Santana uh, music. And it wasn't until I was in college and my major in Chicano studies that I began to be exposed to the whole Chicano history, the movement. And I was able to now bring the two cultures, mi mexicano con mi chicanismo, <laughs> you know, t- together. And so, like I told you, I, I'm, I'm, it's just, it's just, it's special to have you who have ex- your experience. You're like a, a living, breathing history book, amigo. Thank you. But you know, um, scab is so unfair because during the Bracero movement, um, you know, a lot of the growers were bringing these Mexicanos into the United States who had no clue what the social movement was about. Yes. Who just wanted to feed their families. And I think that history is going to be kind to the Braceros who came here and not only uh, um, left from familiar lands to unfamiliar lands and found themselves engulfed in all this social protest and call horrible names. I think history is going to be kind to them because they were just humble people who wanted to feed their family. Yes. And I would never use those words because just like I tell people today when I speak to the schools, I think um, it's unfortunate that we call these people scabs because they were just trying to feed their families and they were not aware of all the social ills that were occurring here in the United yes. States. So I'm hoping that history um, will be kinder to, to the Braceros who came here. Yes. Not to the fault of their own, but they were brought right. here from the growers who were yeah. trying to replace the picketers. And, yeah. and and so I'm hoping that one day, you know, we all can sit together for the United Farm Workers Union and give credit to those families. Because um, a lot of them, once they became familiar with what was going on in the movement, joined the picket lines. But I think that was more what needed to be done was more education to the Brasilians. Yeah. But how can you fault someone who trying to feed their families. Yes, yes. So thank you, Alberto, for, for saying that. You remind me, I had the opportunity also to um, hear Dolores Huerta speak uh, in person. She actually came to Mountain View and uh, she spoke there. And uh, afterwards, I kind of shared with her. I had I was fortunate to go behind stage with her. And I, I shared with her a little bit about the story here that I, that I told you. And she basically said the same thing that you said. Uh, and that is, is saying, hey, you know, it's what you said, educating our community in what the social movement, the justice is. And many times people are not educated, right? So you don't know what you don't know, uh, you know? So, but definitely. Um, I'd like to tell us uh, about your the Cisa Puede Foundation and then, you know, tell us about uh, your iRise Foundation. What is, what is, yeah. What si se puede? How did that come about? Its role and who it serves? Si se puede. When I first initially started, it was um, the slogan from the United Farm Workers Union. And yes. Because I was um, involved with the United Farm Workers Union, I wanted to play tribute to the United Farm Workers, so I called it Si se puede. 
And um, my first, uh, I ended up in the city of Scottsdale, which was predominantly very affluent area. And I didn't know that there was a lot of Latinos there because, but, but because of the hotels and restaurant industries, there was a pocket of Latinos in an area called Minnesota. And um, that was very interesting because it was right next to this beautiful, expensive mall and right next to the affluent non-Latino community. So um, I was on the board of Chicanos por la Causa and the former CEO, Pete Garcia. And Chicanos por la Causa is uh, I fast becoming the number one Latino nonprofit in the United States and really going internationally. So I owe a lot to them as well. But Pete Garcia got me involved. Uh, he called me and he says, Alberto, I hear you want to do more. And I said, yes, sir. He says, well, why don't you go to Scottsdale? Because we're having some issues with the non-Latino and the Latino community. I said, what's going on? Well, the non-Latino was referring to our community as pigs. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a lot of division and tension there. So I said, I think I can help. So I went over there and I met with the Latino community and I met with the non-Latino community. And basically with the Latino community, it was about acculturation mm. they just arrived so there was they weren't aware of that you can't have music at three o'clock in the morning and you know those type of issues and um, so what i did was i taught english to the latino community and i taught spanish to the non-latino community and i began to to tear down the walls that divided community and bring people to the table of a racial understanding and harmony and we brought these people together so I began to correct a lot of the ills that were happening in that community. So for example, there was a lot of apartments there and a lot of the managers were working for the owners and these managers would house three families for one bedroom. Mm. And, uh, they were charging all the rent and it was infested, infested with uh, roaches and rats and that sort of thing. So mm. one of the things that I did is I exposed them to Three On Your Side, which does investigative work. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. We exposed them, and, and so um, things got a little bit better because of the exposure, and then um, a lot of those managers that were stealing money from our community were fired, and they brought in some new managers, and then they cleaned up the area. So I was really proud of that. And then with the non-Latino community, I taught them Spanish, so we began to build a bridge, better understanding of each other, because I truly believe that people don't get along because they never sit down and talk. Yes. Yeah. They never sat down and talked. So we began to talk. We had uh, the pride days where we go to clean up the neighborhood and do that type of thing. And then I would teach English and then we would have barbecues where we would invite, you know, both communities and we started to make a difference. So that's when the Cesar Puede Foundation began to grow. And then I began to bring in other things. Now, the Cesar Puede at that time was not a nonprofit. It was just an idea. Yeah. It was just an idea. So I brought in dance for the for the kids. I brought in soccer. We did a mural in the city of Scottsdale, which is very affluent and non-Latino. We had a wall with the Virgen de Guadalupe, the Cesar Chavez, and a graduate holding a diploma. It was kind of controversial at that time because <laughs> no one expected the Cesar Chavez and, and <laughs> Cesar Chavez, and then you know with the logo, and then the Virgen de Guadalupe. Yeah. The reason why I put the Virgen de Guadalupe is because that mural was defaced with a lot of gang graffiti. And I thought, hey, nobody's going to deface this mural. Yes. We did that. And that became a meeting place for folks. And um, the older community brought in candles and they would pray. Now, there was a pool, six foot pool there. By the, and and it, it was just a big hole. It was so dangerous that kids were playing around it. Little kids would play around it. And thank God nobody passed away as a result of that. Nobody fell in. I got this mm -hmm. to fill it up with cement and that became Cisa Puede Foundation right there in that community underneath the tree, right there. Beautiful. <laughs> right there. So if you go on my LinkedIn, you're gonna see a Fiesta Farewell. And um, hopefully that we can kind of show that. But uh, when the community realized that I was leaving, because uh, I didn't say anything, I, I wanted to go into the schools. I wanted to bring in the Cesar Puede Foundation into the schools and work with students there. So it was very tough. They gave me a farewell 
the uh, United Farm Workers were there. Paul Chavez, who is the son of Sister Chavez, was there to wish me well. It was a beautiful event. And that was the spark that I needed to go into the school. So Si Se Puede began to evolve, began to oh, evolve. Oh, okay. So it was a one-man show going from school to school, working with yeah. kids who, at that time, the phrase was at risk. Yes. Uh, at risk was very popular, but I was working with kids who were heavily involved in gangs. Yeah. And I would be out in the communities at two in the morning working with these kids who were heavily involved in gangs, and we would have the cleanup days, and we would have dance, we'd close off the streets. Uh, um, and it just kept growing, and it kept growing, and it kept growing, so I kept advancing. Mind you, I didn't have any funding at that time. I was using my savings. I must have exhausted over $100,000. And um, wow. when I got called to Chandler, I was flat broke. I was living in a vacant office. And I gave up on the Lord. Oh, gee. I mean, I really mm. felt that he's not helping me. I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. I gave up on him. And that night, as I was sleeping in the vacant office on the floor, very cold and wanted to give up, I had a dream that night. Honest to God, this is a true story that the Lord said, you never were alone. I was always behind you, making mm -hmm. sure you were protected. And I woke up that morning and I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to give it another shot. I'm going to continue to do your work. And thank God I did, because if I would have quit OG, it would have killed me because I never would have known what, what would happen with this organization. So yes. expanding. And then I brought in robotics. Yes. And then with the robotics program, it just kept growing and growing and growing. A couple of years ago, I had cancer. And um, I had to retire. And the doctor said, it's time to retire. And I was, uh, I was crushed um, mm. because I needed the community more than the community needed me. So I took about a year and a half off and I was reflecting on my life and I wasn't happy. And the doctor said, OK. So I started the I Rise Foundation, which is geared to the Native American community. Because I already had been working with the Native American community, but I brought in STEM science, technology, sure. engineering, math. So I began to introduce this to the Native American community in every schools. And what I found is that, and what I coined in the Native American is, they have a culture of gold. And people ask me, explain that. It's rich in traditions, folklore, customs, food, music, and the beautiful elders who have maintained the history generation after generation. So I gave a speech to that to the Native American students, and they loved it. And I've been there for the past six years, and I've been providing uh, STEM programs. And in January, I was asked to go to Nogales, Sonora, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought I was going to work in two schools, but they end up saying 200 schools. So, <laughs> gee. I, wait, wait, wait. Two to 200. <laughs> yeah, so, gee, I fainted and got myself up, and I said, 200? Um, but I decided that that was just too much for me. And at my age and with my health issues, I decided to stay in Sonora, Mexico. And uh, I began to provide a comprehensive STEM program, science, technology, engineering, math to yes. a few of the schools and going to give some resources, whether it be First Lego League Robotics. Now, First Lego League is the entry level to any student who is interested in a career in engineering. So I brought that there and I've been expanding that. I've been expanding that. And my hope is to have first Lego League scrimmage and a competition for the students of Mexico. I and then eventually that, yeah, bring, yeah. And keep going, bring in the underwater robotics and so on and so yeah. forth. So I'm going back in October to visit a couple more schools and introduce them to STEM and bring them some soccer balls. So if any of your the listeners want to donate one soccer ball, we can sure use it. I'm trying to get at least... Yes. About 100 soccer balls to deliver to Mexico, if that's possible. Where, Alberto, where um, should people, is there like a website or how, how do people reach out to you? Or to, should they uh, connect with you on LinkedIn? What, they, uh, can, no? they can connect with me on LinkedIn. My phone number is the 520-252-9532, or they can go to irisefoundation.com and... Um, they can connect with us, but um, we sure can use it because my foundation is fairly new. We have been operating based on just fumes, you know, but yeah. I'm a type of person that 
you know, um, is going to do it anyway, no matter what. Um, yeah. I have a history of, you know, um, you know, if I can dream it, then I can do it. And this is yes. what I've been doing yes. since my career. Yes, 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 yes. Alberto, uh, you know, you obviously, uh, and, and, you know, you shared obviously, you, you know, some of your health challenges here um, with us. And, and, and what I see in you is there is something greater than you that motivates you, that inspires you. And what I see is your desire to help other people, um, you know, do better, be better, live a better life, excel, right? Reach their, their potential. And I think oftentimes, whether it's in Silicon Valley, just in general in the corporate world, you know, we people say they love their job, but the reality is if they love their job, then why is it that they're looking forward to Friday, right? And here you are that what I see is that in spite of the challenges, the obstacles, you just keep persevering. And one of the last things that you just said right now is you said, listen, somehow, and I'm paraphrasing, somehow I'm gonna figure this out. One way or another, I'm gonna get the job done. And again, I think it's because you have a higher calling than just what's in it for Alberto. You know, for others. Robert Kennedy once said this, some people see things that they are and say, why? Mm -hmm. Other people see things that are not and say, why not? Yes. I'm the type of person that would just do it no matter what the naysayer is. You know, I've had a lot of naysayers throughout my career. I don't call them haters because I think that's too strong. Yes. But someone's opinion of you is not your reality. Yes. And this is what I tell the kids is that, you know, someone's opinion of you is not reality. Yeah. They, today is the day where you're going to start fresh and do some great things. But I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to have a second chance. And um, it's been quite of a journey, Oscar. Um, being in the Native community is... Um, Native American community is very special to me. And they're closely like the Latino community and being shy. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I was able to um, go into this community. I love this community. Um, it's been the best time of my life during the IRISE Foundation. I'm yeah. grateful I had the opportunity. I great, great board of directors and um, who allowed me to do it my way, sure. you know. And uh, whenever you have a board like that, I mean, you know, I mean, I love what I do. What can I yeah. say? Of course, no, I, I, uh, I feel it. I feel it, and I see it. And uh, now, I bet what, um, what are you, what, what are you looking forward to accomplish here um, in in, uh, in in your nonprofit, your professional, just your your life? What what is what, what's one or two things that you uh, that are still on your uh, to do list here to check off? I want to truly make a difference, and not only in the Latino community, but in the Native American community, who I hold so dear. Um, I want to be able to go to TED Talk and share my journey, because I think that people can learn from my journey, my experience in the nonprofit world. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. And I tell people that when I'm no longer on Earth, I want somebody to say, you know, he did it his way. It wasn't easy, but it was Alberto's way. <laughs> And there's a and, and so, and I got to get to Berkeley. <laughs> well, gee, if you can help me get to those are my people. That's All where, right, Berkeley. That's where social activism started, and I need to yeah. be where I'm no longer. All right. All right, my Cal peeps, those of you that are listening, watching, okay, uh, uh, please reach out to Alberto. He needs to and wants to and we need to have his his presence there uh, his message there at uh at berkeley at uc berkeley so that's my goal is to continue with irise and make it an international program i think we're on our journey our next stop is africa and um you know to go work with some of the orphanages out there that don't have access to stem so just like i said access to stem shouldn't be shouldn't be um related to your zip code I mean, everybody needs an opportunity to dream, you know, to be able to dream about careers in STEM because that's the future. And one last thing, I mean, I'm not sure how much time I have, but, you know, here's a poem that I would like to be said when I'm no longer here. 
And I'm not thinking about death in a morbid sense, though, G. It's just, you yeah, know, as you right. think about them, is that it's called 100 years from now. And there's no author attached to it, but it says something like this. And I'll paraphrase. 100 years from now, it won't matter what type of house I lived in, what type of car, car I drove, or how much money I had in the bank. But the world may be just a little bit better because Alberto Sparzo was in the lives of children, families, and communities. Amen. Amen. And to that, if you notice, everyone, the background image that Alberto has a, a group of ballet folklorico dancers, uh, you know, of different ages and uh, you know, to his left shoulder, right, depending on how you're looking at it, you see a little kid there uh, kind of sticking out. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, again, and, and a visual example, Alberto, of you always looking to make life a little better for that next generation. And uh, That's my goal. And because of the arts, we're able to we're able to get our community out there, let the community appreciate who we are as Latinos and a beautiful culture, rich in music. And we got a lot of talented young people out there that have continued with the arts with us and have gone on to college and majored in arts. Yeah. Well, Alberto, muchísimas gracias for um, being again on uh, Career Talk with OG. Uh, again, your story is very heartfelt, very inspirational, and you're you're a great great man uh, with uh, un corazón grandísimo. That um, somehow you have an endless amount of giving uh, and and serving uh, to to others. And thank you, thank you for for being uh, like that. Um, but um, everyone, again, thank you so much for joining us today on Career Talk with uh, with OG. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, with the uh, real OG, Alberto Esparza. Alberto, gracias, amigo. It's a pleasure to be on your podcast, and I'm glad to know you. And I'm sure that we're going to be good, be great friends going forward. And especially when I get to Berkeley. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Have a beautiful week, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us.